There are many sources that say Hugo Boss, whose name is now synonymous with stylish clothing and fragrances, was an ardent Nazi who designed and made uniforms worn by the SS and the Nazi party. Is there any truth to this? And is the title of Hitler's tailor that he acquired? Or is it just another urban myth that has grown over the years to now become accepted as fact? Well, let's examine. Hugo Boss was born in Metzigen, Germany, on the 8th of July, 1885. He was initially an apprentice merchant until he was called up for military service from 1903 to 1905. He then went to work in a weaving mill before taking over his parents' small linen and lingerie shop in 1908. At the outbreak of World War I in 1914, he was called up to serve and he served throughout the entire conflict. In 1923, he opened up his own shop and in 1924, he started a small factory with two other partners. They had several clothing lines, namely in workwear, shirts, raincoats and sportswear, but certainly not the high-end fashion items of today and definitely no fragrances. The factory employed between 20 and 30 workers in his early years. He was commissioned by a textiles distributor called Rudolf Born for a large batch of shirts, including brown shirts, for a fringe political party called the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party, better known as the Nazi Party. In 1929, the global economic crisis known as the Great Depression hit, and this caused problems in every sector, including the textile industry. For small operations such as bosses, there was no chance and by 1931, he was facing bankruptcy. After working with creditors, he was once again left with just six sewing machines and to start all over again. That year, Hugo Boss became a member of the Nazi party, which had grown expeditionally, and it was starting to become somewhat of a political force. The company then began receiving contracts for uniforms, but not only the brown shirts for the Nazi party's paramilitary, the SA, but also for the Hitler Youth and the SS, the political soldiers of the Nazi regime. Uniform manufacturing was something that was very decentralised in Nazi Germany, and with most production being handled by small and medium enterprises like bosses. His was not by no means a leading company in the industry, and he only employed around 120 people at the time. In 1938, however, as Hitler was rapidly expanding the armed forces, major contracts for uniforms for the army came in. One former seamstress, Edith Pohler, said that they were dizzy with relief and felt like they had finally made it. This was shown by the fact that in 1936, the company's turnover was 200,000 Reichsmarks, and by 1940, it was around a million Reichsmarks. However, after the Nazis introduced fixed commodity pricing, it fell to around 750,000 Reichsmarks in 1942, before rising again to around 800,000 in 1944. After the start of World War II, the company, like many others, saw a shortage of staff due to military service or potential employees going to work in more lucrative and better paid industries, such as engineering. Contracts were issued to produce uniforms for the regular army and the Waffen SS, and with an increase in contracts, the company turned, as did so many others, to the use of forced labour. From April 1940, the first labourers began to arrive. They were not prisoners of war or people from the concentration camp system, but rather, most were from Poland, who had been forcibly relocated to Germany with the help of the Gestapo. Boss received around 140 such labourers, and for a brief period between October 1940 and April 1941, he also had 40 French labourers. But what were their conditions like? Well, the men lived in sheds in the company's own compound until 1943. They were described as rudimentary but hygienic. The women were quartered with local families, and at the start of 1943, however, major companies in Mexican built a camp for the Eastern European labourers to centralise them and segregate them from the local population. This was a requirement of the local government in a law enacted on the 21st of August 1943. There were serious financial issues for the new camp, which partly explains the poor food and hygienic situations. After all, they were forced to live in the camp, conditions deteriorated. One former Hugo Boss labourer, a 17-year-old Polish lad called Jan Kondak, was forced to work in the factory from 1942 until 1945. He recalls the hygiene being very poor, stating, in the barracks, there were fleas and lice. He also described the food as insufficient, given the hours that they had to work. And during air raids, the force was not allowed into bomb shelters, but had to stay in the factory. Another labourer recalls being rounded up by the Gestapo from her hometown in Poland in 1940 and forced to work at the Boss factory at the age of 19. She remembers the medical facilities as poor. There was no special treatment for pregnant women and children, she says, and there was no way to visit a doctor. If we had a disease, we had to treat it ourselves. There are conflicting reports of how the labourers were treated. Several of them were positive about Boss himself, but the company management also contained some committed Nazis who treated the women, for that's what most of the employees were, harshly and would threaten them with eviction to the concentration camps. 
It's likely that Hugo Boss wasn't personally aware of these incidents, but he must have been aware. And in any case, he did nothing to stop them. Some credit must go to Hugo Boss, however, as he did try to alleviate the problem at the beginning of 1944 by having the females excluded from the camp food system and instead feeding them in his own canteen. There is evidence that the company tried to improve the food for the labourers, giving them a midday meal, which other factories in the area didn't provide. And they were, of course, paid. After all, they weren't prisoners until they decided to leave the factory. This gives us the sad story of Josepha Gisterek. She was one of the four Hugo Boss labourers to have died in the service of the company. The other three, according to the municipal documents, died of natural causes. Like most of the labourers, Josepha was Polish and arrived at the factory in 1941 joining her sister Anna, who had been there since the previous year. Their father contacted them, saying that he needed help with the other eight children. Josepha then applied for leave, but this was rejected on the grounds that she hadn't worked the factory long enough. She travelled home anyway and was subsequently arrested by the Gestapo. She then spent a year and a half in several concentration camps, including Buchenwald and Auschwitz. When Hugo Boss found out where she was through his Nazi party contacts, she was forced to return to the factory, where the foreman wanted to make an example of her to the other labourers. She was denied the right to see a doctor until she got to the point where she suffered a physical breakdown. She was then allowed three months off work, but at the end of this period, when she was due to return to work in the factory, she committed suicide in the house of the family that she was staying with. Hugo Boss paid for the funeral and also the travel expenses of her family to attend the funeral. Boss has since been criticised in recent years for not doing more for the family, but to be fair, he probably did more than any other factory owner at the time would have done, especially helping financially with the funeral. It's difficult to tell what his thoughts were. On one hand, he tried to improve conditions. He rescued Josepha from a concentration camp and did give her three months off work, a blight, only after it broke down. On the other hand, it appears he did nothing to stop the harsh punishments meted out by his foreman. Simplistic characterizations of the man are very hard to draw. Was he a rabid anti-Semite or virulent Nazi? Probably not. There is no evidence of this. However, like most of the others at the time, it seems he didn't have a problem with the Nazis. Like most businessmen, party membership was a sensible option. It saved the business from day-to-day -day control and the micromanagement by the Nazi functionaries. They would then just keep a general oversight, which was better than the business being confiscated and given to another who was more likely to toe the line. Like most German businessmen, Boss seems to have been pragmatic and understood that doing well meant keeping favour with the regime. So, as we've seen, Hugo Boss did indeed produce uniforms for the Nazis, but he certainly didn't design them. This dubious honour goes to two members of the Nazi party, SS Oberfuhrer, Professor Karl Diebeschitz, and a graphic designer named Walter Heck. Heck designed and stylized the SS rooms in 1929, and then in 1932, the pair designed the black SS uniform. Neither of them had any in affiliation with the Hugo Boss company. As we've also seen, despite being known now as Hitler's tailor, Boss's company was only one of many small companies that manufactured uniforms for the regime, and it was by no means the largest. The name was also not the famous one that it is today, but it is easy to see that because the name is now so famous and the fact that Boss did carry out work for the Nazis, that people, either out of ignorance or malniciousness, can come to the conclusions that are now prevalent. But what happened after the war? Metzigen was occupied by the Western Allies in April 1945, and it fell into the French zone of occupation. Along with so many others, Hugo Boss was forced to undergo denazification programmes in which he was classified as incriminated, and he was also fined 100,000 Reichsmarks. This was the second highest punishment imposed. The reasons were due to his early membership of the Nazi party, his profiteering from National Socialism, and his friendship with local party leaders in Mexican. However, Boss appealed the conviction and was subsequently reclassified as a follower, which meant that he complied with the regime without actually being involved in the politics. Boss also lost the right to run a company, so the business was given to his son-in-law, Eugene Holy. Production of the uniforms continued, this time for the French Occupation Forces and the Red Cross. Hugo Boss died on the 9th of August 1948, aged 63. His death was caused by complications from a tooth abscess. In the 1950s, the company began selling suits again, and by the end of the 1960s, it had a total sale of 3.5 million Deutschmarks, although it was actually on the verge of bankruptcy. In 1969, Joachim and Hugh Holy took over the company and began to shape it from a small local factory into the international powerhouse that it is today. Well, that concludes the Hugo Boss story. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you all for subscribing, liking, commenting. It's very much appreciated. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much.